Okay. So let's uh, carry on now. Uh, so this is how all of these uh, problems come to an end. You stop the papancha of the mind. Uh, and then, interesting, yeah, we just saw this before. This is what the Buddha said uh, when he had spoken. And the Holy One, Holy One here is the Sugato. That's how he translates the word Sugato, which literally means the one who has gone well, something like that. Uh, he got up from his seat and entered his dwelling. Uh, after giving this very enigmatic statement, he kind of gets up. Uh, kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> this maybe the Buddha is up to some, uh, some, something uh, smart here, some wisdom, uh, wisdom thing here. So what happens then? So I'm going to, now I'm going to use uh, Wai Yin's uh, uh, beautifully put together thing because uh, now it's going to, there's a bit of, um, bit of, um, it's not so important, so we can go a bit faster, and it's kind of handy to have. Uh, so this is put together by Wai Yin. And uh, let me just get it into full screen mode so that we can uh, not have all this nonsense. Is that okay? Is that good? Can you see? Yeah. The white background, but anyway. So, uh, yeah, so there we have, you can see the bottom there, yeah. He got up and on his seat and he entered his dwelling, yeah. Then what do you think happened? What happened then is the following. Yeah? Soon after the Buddha left, those mendicants considered. Uh, the Buddha gave this brief passage for recitation, this brief teaching, and then entered his dwelling without explaining the meaning in detail. Who can explain in detail the meaning of the brief passage for recitation given by the Buddha? Yeah, so this is what happens. Uh, and sometimes there's different kinds of monks. I don't think any nuns give explanations because the nuns are not all that present in the suttas. Uh, but there are nuns who are said to be of great wisdom, so no doubt they could have explained it, uh, but uh, they're just not there. Um, though, then those mendicants uh, thought... Uh, this venerable Mahakachana is praised by the Buddha and esteemed by his sensible spiritual companions. He is capable of explaining in detail the meaning of this, this brief passage for recitation given by the Buddha. Let's go to him and ask him about this matter. So, um, yeah, uh, so here we have. Uh, First of all, those mendicants considered, yeah? The word mendicant, are you familiar with the word mendicant? Yeah, no, no, not familiar? Okay, so mendicant means someone who is begging for arms, yeah? So, and this is exactly the same thing as a bhikkhu and bhikkhuni, yeah? Is that right, Venerable Punsiriwara? Hmm. It's true, isn't it? Bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, beg begging for arms, yeah? It's the same thing, it means a bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, it means someone who begs for arms, it's exactly the same thing, yeah? So uh, that's why he translates as mendicants. And mendicant has this nice feeling of uh, being gender inclusive. The suttas are often both addressed to monks and nuns, uh, but very often because the monks are more senior, you don't actually see that. But by using the word mendicants, you get more kind of that comes, comes through better uh, in the English language. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the word mendicant. It means someone who is, uh, receives arms. Uh, it's an old-fashioned English word, but uh, it is also it is very precise. Uh, so then they think, who can give, uh, who can explain this? And they go to Venerable Mahakachana. And Mahakachana is uh, famous for being one who explains the short passages of the Buddha. I think he maybe is called one of the Anga, Angasavakas. Yeah, the Angasavakas. You know the Angasavaka? Anga, no, Anga is peak. Yeah, the best. Savaka is disciple. So Angasavaka means the peak disciples are the best disciples. And there is a whole chapter in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourse says the first chapter, the ones which are about all the various Angasavakas, all the peak or top disciples. We have Venerable Sariputta, his top monk, top in wisdom. Yeah, Venerable Maha Mughalana, top in psychic powers. Venerable Anuruddha, top in the divine eye. Yeah, Veda Mahakachana, top in, I think, explaining short teachings or something like that. Yeah, so it's kind of a, so he's one of those very 
small group of top disciples that you see, uh, Mahavan Mahakashana. So they usually go to him when they want things explained. So these are famous monks at the time of the Buddha. This is not just a random monk. Some of them are random, but this is not random. So not random. <laughs> And so he's praised by the Buddha and his sensible spiritual companions. Yeah, Vinyu, this means like the wise spiritual companions. I like the word sensible, it's quite nice here. So some of your spiritual companions are not so sensible. Yeah. <laughs> you, you come here, you come here to the BGF, and it's true, there's a variety. Yeah? Some of you are probably I've been around for a long time. Some of you are more wise. Some of you are just beginning out. But even though you're not so sensible yet, we will make you sensible. Yeah? So please, <laughs> please, come, please keep coming. And gradually, the sensibility will increase as we go along. Yeah? So uh, we cannot always, not, not everyone is going to be on the same level. That's perfectly OK. So it is the sensible people that we should listen to. Yeah? That's actually a very important point. Uh, and this is the first line of the... Um, of the Mahamangala Sutta, yeah, the Great Blessing Sutta, yeah, Asevana Chabala Nang Pandita Nang Shasevana, yeah, Asevana Chabala Nang, don't associate with fools, Pandita Nang Shasevana, associate with the wise people. So uh, there's this kind of distinction here. It, it means uh, that uh, I think everyone here is already considered reasonably wise, otherwise you wouldn't be here. <laughs> There is some truth to that, right? And I, it's not just, I'm not just saying that to kind of, uh, to kind of you know, it's, it also feels good when we are honest about these things, but there's some truth to that. Uh, because anyone who is interested in the Buddhist teaching has some kind of root qualities that are very positive, yeah? Positive intention, wanting to do the right thing. Uh, is there anyone here who does not want to be a good person? Uh, if you don't want to be a good person, the door is over there. <laughs> but, but, yeah, you are here for that reason, right? That's kind of only sensible reason to be here. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother being here. So, of course, you already have that degree of sensibility there. That's already kind of heading in the right direction. So, you're, everyone here is not a fool in the sense of the Mahamangala Sutta, but sensibility is going to vary a little bit. And we try to follow the more sensible people. They're the ones who point the, right, point the way in the right direction here. And so then he is capable of explaining the meaning. So let's go to him and ask about this matter. Those mendicants went to Venerable to Mahakachana and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, they sat down to one side. They told him what had happened and said, May Venerable Mahakachana please explain this. And then he replies, this is kind of a nice reply here. Yeah. Reverend, suppose there was a person in need of heartwood, and while wandering in search of heartwood, he would come across a large tree standing with heartwood. But he would pass over the roots and trunk, imagining that the heartwood should be sought in the branches and leaves. Such is the consequence for the Venerable, though you were face to face with the Buddha, you overlooked him, imagining that you should ask me about this matter. <laughs> Quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. For he is the Buddha, the one who knows and sees. He is vision, he is knowledge, he is the manifestation of principle. He is the manifestation of divinity. He is the teacher, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the bestower of the deathless, the lord of truth, the realized one. That was the time to approach the Buddha and ask him about this matter. You should have remembered it in line with the Buddha's answer. So um, basically he's saying one should go to the Buddha to ask, uh, ask questions. And this is one of the reasons I always like to go to the suttas, because this is, in a sense, the closest we have these days of asking the Buddha for the answer, coming to the suttas. And so I think that is very important. And I feel that as a monastic, this is one of my duties, to teach the word of the Buddha. And because why do I live like a monastic? How is it that I can come here to the BGF and be looked after so well? Why is that? Because I'm a monk, because I follow the teaching of the Buddha. That's the reason, yeah? If the Buddha wasn't there, if I wore these robes without the Buddha, you would think, who is this fool wearing funny clothes? Yeah. That's what you think, you kick me out of here. It's because of the Buddha that this works. This system was set up by the Buddha. 
And so I have a sense of gratitude or a debt of gratitude to the Buddha. And so I should teach very carefully in line with his teachings. Uh, that is the right approach for a monastic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and uh, so what does he say then about the Buddha? This is kind of interesting. First of all, the Buddha is the heartwood. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and then he has all of these uh, little uh, epithets of the Buddha. Yeah, the one who knows and sees. Uh, he is vision. He is knowledge. Let me just check the, uh, the Pali again, because uh, uh, these things are important to, I, th I think it's probably Jnana Bhutto and Chakra Bhutto or something like that. Uh, but, uh, oh, I forgot to press got it. Does that mean it doesn't work? Oh, that's, okay. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Life is uncertain. That's the, absolutely the case. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Um, Where are we? Wow, so much stuff. Uh, so here we are. Yeah, yeah. So he is, um, he is vision, he is knowledge. He is chakku bhuto, he is jnana bhuto. You can see the Pali on this side here. It's kind of nice. You can see the Pali on the English side by side. Uh, this is what this website called, uh, uh, called uh, Sutta Central yeah, is why it is so good, because it has all of these kind of beautiful little functions. So. So, uh, yeah. Mm. What happened? Uh, oh, that's right. I'm, I was on the other page. I'm becoming old and senile. Uh, okay. Nola. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so he, he has become the I, he has become knowledge. Uh, and these are kind of beautiful ways of thinking about the Buddha. Yeah, even though we think of the Buddha as a human being, which he was, uh, and uh, he had the same. What, what is interesting about him, when you look at the Buddha before his awakening, he was basically had the same problems as we have. Uh, in, we'll come back to this later on. Uh, uh, and then the awakening is also potentially available for us. So there is no fundamental difference between us and the Buddha. But uh, the Buddha, through his awakening, he has become knowledge. Yeah? Chakunyana here means like the profound understanding of reality. He has become insight. He has become these things because uh, uh, that is what his mind is. Yeah? The Buddha's mind is no longer papancha. It is no longer thinking about the world. Yeah? He has become these teachings that he is. And everything he thinks, everything he does is in align with that. Is aligned with that. Uh, that's re really what it is. Uh, he has become the eye or vision. In other words, the way he looks at the world, that is the way the world actually is. Uh, yeah? He has become that vision. That's what he is as a person. Uh, and so you become psychologically transformed when you become the Buddha or you become an Arahant. You are no longer a person in the sense that you were before. And so this is how you can think of the Buddha. The Buddha is compassion. He is wisdom. He is these qualities. He is the manifestation of principle. He is Dhamma Bhutto. He is the manifestation of divinity. Brahma Bhutto. These are kind of interesting as well. Manifestation of principle. This is manifestation of the Dhamma. He has become the Dhamma. He has become these teachings. He, his entire psychological makeup is now basically Dhamma. Yeah, this, this is what it is. And it is nothing really apart from that. Everything is just good qualities and thinking in a straight way. So the Buddha and the Dhamma are almost indistinguishable at this point. He has become divinity. Rama Bhutto. What does that mean? Does that mean he has become like the eternal consciousness of the universe? The soul, the root reality of everything else? He is indistinguishable from the Brahma of the Brahmanical teachings? Is that what it means? Hmm. <laughs> Could that be the case? Probably not, yeah, because the Buddha was... he. 
it taught in contradistinction to the Brahmanical teachings. The whole point, one of the things that the Buddha does when he arises in the world, or when he kind of gets his insights, part of what he understands is that the existing ideas about Brahma, about Atman, the self, these are all wrong. This cannot really mean that. It cannot be a reference to the Brahmanical teachings or the Upanishads or the Vedas, which was the existing teaching at the time, which had this idea of the world spirit. Yeah, the world and the self is the same. So loko, so atta is a sentence that you see in the suttas. So loko, so atta. The, that world that is that self. That self is that world. The same thing. When you see the universe around you, what you are seeing according to the Brahmanical teachings, you're seeing a manifestation of the world soul. I'm not sure if that world soul is all that impressive. I'm just seeing all of these things hanging here. <laughs> That's what you're seeing. You look into the night sky. You can imagine in those days, yeah, when you were two and a half thousand years ago, they hadn't really any understanding of astronomy or anything like that. When they looked up into the world, into the sky, you can imagine why they might think, yeah, the moon is out, the stars are kind of shining. Can you see the stars here in KL? Sometimes, yeah? There's not too much light. There's too much light, you can't really see the stars properly. Yeah. And you can see why they might think in that way, yeah? And of course, this has been going on for all, most cultures in the world. You see the you look up and what you see is the heavens. Yeah, this is kind of in Europe until very recently, that was very much the case before the Copernicus and you know the Copernican ideas about the earth moving around the sun and all these kind of things. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, other cultures, but uh, so uh, the Buddha was against these things. So Brahma here means something else. Uh, and what it means in the Buddhist context, uh, Brahma means like the highest or the best. Uh, or the, um, the ultimate, or the primary thing. Yeah. There's a very interesting translation. There is a famous, one of the very well-known suttas called the Brahmajala Sutta, the first sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha. And uh, it is often translated as Brahma's net or something like that, or the divine net. But uh, Bhattu Suddhartha translates as the prime net. Prime, because it is first, it is foremost. It is like the highest, yes, yeah? the prime net. That's kind of an, I don't know, I, when I first time I saw, what, what is he talking about, the prime net? And it started to dawn on me, yeah, this is actually quite a nice translation, the prime net. It makes you think in a new way. So that's kind of the nice thing about that. So here we're talking about something that is primary, something that is the highest. The Brahmas, according to Buddhist ideas. Remember in Buddhism, we humans, we're kind of quite low. Yeah, we're kind of very ordinary on this realm. Okay, we have some good things going for us. We can practice well and live well, these kind of things. But actually, in the hierarchy of things, we're kind of the lowest of the, of the happy realms, right? You go below the human realm and you're in serious trouble. You don't go below this. This is the lowest you should ever go. And then we have, the, the, above that, we have all these various realms, yeah? And as you ascend and go higher and higher into these heavenly realms, they become more and more pure, more and more beautiful, yeah? more and more powerful, yeah? And when you come all the way to the Brahma realms, uh, that is where you come to the realms of pure loving kindness, pure compassion, pure equanimity, yeah? very powerful and beautiful mental qualities and states. Uh, and so the Buddha has kind of become the equivalent of those Brahmas. He has those same qualities as the Brahmas in those highest realms. Uh, and that is, I think, why he's called Brahma Bhutto uh, in this particular context. He has become a divinity. Uh, well, he is the manifestation of divinity, as uh, Bhattu Sujato says here. But not just divinity, high divinity, yeah? transcendental divinity in a certain way, transcendental, transcending the uh, sensual world in that sense. And then he is the Lord of Truth, yeah? uh, Lord of Truth, Dhammasami. Is that right, Dhammasami? Yeah. Who has the suttas? Uh, Wai Yang, have you got the suttas available? I know you're usually very, very quick on the ball, yeah, but uh, is it? <laughs> the Lord of Truth. Dhammasami? Yeah, Dhammasami, yes, it's the Lord of Truth. Yeah, okay, great. It's Dhammasami. Yeah. Actually, I have a monastic friend, oh, not very close friend. He's called Dhammasami. Now I realize what his name means. Wow, it's an epithet of the Buddha. Okay. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay. okay. 
So this is how he talks about the Buddha. Yeah? So this also gives us a, a feeling for the Buddha. So this, on the one side, it's nice to point out the humanity of the Buddha. On the other side, it's nice to point out what the Buddha has actually become through becoming an Arahant. So this is the other side of this. Um, that's half an hour, isn't it? I tend to get really... Con no, it's it nine more minutes. Bobby, you're the, you're the master of time. I, I, I am sort of... <laughs> Half, we started that at 2 o'clock, 2.30, 20 minutes. I think we had 10 more minutes, uh, 20 past 2, right? Uh, 8 more minutes. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's carry on. So, uh, so they say all of these things, and then the monks reply. What do the monks say? They say, certainly he is the Buddha, the one who knows and sees. He is vision, he is knowledge. He is the manifestation of principle. He is the manifestation of divinity. He is the teacher, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the bestower of the deathless, the lord of truth, the realized one. Hmm. Uh, that was the time to approach the Buddha and ask about this matter. We should have remembered it in line with the Buddha's answer. Still, Mahakachana is praised by the Buddha and esteemed by his sensible spiritual companions. You are capable of explaining in detail the meaning of this brief passage for recitation given by the Buddha. Please explain this, if it is no trouble now. <laughs> We're getting desperate now. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, one of the best ways of asking someone to, uh, if you want to ask someone for something, yeah, for some favor or something like that, uh, you want to ask someone to come here and give a talk, uh, you want to ask someone to go to a funeral, to a dana or something like that, uh, you, should, you, know how to, you know how you should ask? Why, uh, you know? Ah, well done. You have, you've been coming. That's excellent. Good memory. Good. Uh, because this is actually in the suttas, yeah, Anukampang Upadaya. That's kind of very often how they how they will say these things, uh, and that is uh, it's very interesting because uh, remember that the Buddha does everything out of compassion. Uh, yeah, when the Buddha after his awakening, then he surveyed the world with the eye of the Buddha, and when he surveyed the other world, the Buddha he saw being suffering, and then he was moved by compassion, yeah, to be able to help beings. Uh, and so people who are wise, who are arahants or stream mentors or whatever, they do things out of compassion. That is what moves them. That is what is important to them because that is what they have to offer the world. So if, you, if there is a really good monk or good nun or whoever who you would like to invite to something, yeah, right, Can, would you please come out of compassion? Then they will consider it. But if you say, I just want to make some merit, then maybe they <laughs> know what they will say. Or if you say that, uh, uh, if you try to flatter them, yeah, don't try to flatter them because uh, they don't like flattery usually uh, when we get to that point. Uh, I think that flattery is um, it's kind of dodgy. So uh, ask, ask in the right way. Uh. Okay, so let us, um, let us move on. Uh, well then, reverends, listen and apply your mind well. I will speak. Yes, Reverend, they replied. Venerable Mahakarsana said this. Oi, too far. So this is what I, we just had, yeah? So listen and apply your minds well, I will speak. Yeah? And uh, this is another kind of uh, nice little point that you see right there. Uh, listen and apply your mind well. Uh, and this is kind of the right way to hear the Dhamma of the Buddha, especially uh, by really applying your mind uh, yeah, when these words are being spoken. Uh, it means that you really listen. Uh, you, you know, you don't, drift off too much. I mean, sometimes you drift off. That's okay. That's kind of life. Yeah, No one is going to be on the ball all the time. That's impossible. But uh, you try to follow what's going on. You try to understand what is happening. Yeah, You apply your mind. The Buddha says this every time he gives a talk. 
In other words, I'm about, the Buddha says basically, I'm about to give you the most important message anyone can give someone else. I'm about to give you a gift. I'm about to give you a gift that has the potential to make you happy, overcome all suffering. This is the highest gift that anyone can give anyone else. How do you feel if someone gives you a gift? Maybe you feel happy. Maybe you feel gratitude. Yeah, wow, the game. Wow, that's so sweet. Thank you so much for giving me a gift. You feel really happy about that. But all of these ordinary gifts that we get from ordinary people, they're nothing. Yeah, this is a far, far higher gift. And the reason why we're not overjoyed whenever we get the gift of the Buddha is because we don't really understand what this actually is. This is something extraordinary. This has a chance to change your life completely and to make you overcome all suffering, to give rise to all the happiness that you have ever thought about was even possible to get and more beyond. You didn't even know there was so much happiness available. It's like, whoa, this is amazing. And so this is what it is. So the Buddha is about to deliver this kind of message. He's about to give you the highest gift any human being can give to any other kind of human being. Of course we should listen. Yeah, If someone is about to tell you there's a treasure over there and there is a 10 million ringgit yeah, buried underground, and they, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you where it is, will you listen or will you just say, yeah, whatever, yeah, who cares? Yeah, You're going to listen, right? And that treasure is nothing. That's peanuts. Who cares? Probably better off not listening. Yeah, it's going to cause you all kinds of problems if you get 10 million ringgit. You pick it out of the ground. As soon as you pick it out, someone's going to steal it from you. Oh, the endless suffering because of that. But this, no suffering. Yeah, just the highest happiness. This is far more interesting than 10 million ringgits or 100 million US dollars or whatever it is that you want. This is what is really interesting. And so we see this in the suttas that this is why. This is called the triple gem. Yeah? This is why uh, uh, the Buddha compares the mind with goal, because you're actually purifying goal. This is the real goal that is available on this path. Uh, so it is very, very powerful. Yeah? And of course, we should listen when we are in the presence of something so important. Uh, and that is what this really means. Uh, so listen. Yeah, I should listen. Wow, well, yeah, let me listen to this. Uh, this is really a matter of life and death. This is about the very meaning of life itself. And this is, I think, I say this so often, but it's hard to kind of get our hands really, get a grip on that. But that's exactly what it is. It is about the meaning of life. Everything else is just details. Everything else is kind of not all that interesting. This is what is interesting. And I think that um, if we were able to sell this message to the world, uh, that the Dhamma really is about the meaning of life. Because remember, humanity has been searching for the meaning of life for millennia. Yeah, this is what all philosophy is about. This is what all spiritual search is about in all cultures around the world. All cultures in the world have philosophers and spiritual seekers. Why? Because we all are looking, yearning for meaning, for real purpose. And the one person who found that real meaning was the Buddha. Everyone else, they found a little bit of it. But the Buddha is the one who really got it right. And so this is about the meaning of life. And uh, I think that is what we really need to sell to the world. Uh, and then everyone becomes a Buddhist. Uh. <laughs> is that good? A good idea? <laughs> it's never going to happen. Yeah, it's not going to happen. But uh, we need to kind of sell this, uh, uh, this, this amazing teachings better. We are not good salespeople. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I wish, yeah. Anyway, Ajahn, Ajahn Brahm was quite a good salesperson. That's why I, that's why I went to Perth because I, I he 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 sold it very quickly uh, to me. <laughs> so anyway, let's uh, have another ten minute uh, meditation break. Yeah. So, uh, again, any uh, comments or questions, please? Uh. Ajahn, um, Brahma Bhutto, um, does that have to do with Brahma Viharas? And are Brahma Viharas the Deva Nusatis? 
Uh, okay, so uh, does it have to Brahma? I think it probably does have with Brahma Vihara, so, because otherwise it sounds like you have become become God. Yeah, you have become God, which is kind of really weird. So I think it is. Yeah, it has to do with that. It has to do with that you have become essentially the equivalent of those high gods, uh, which includes the Brahma Viharas and includes all the good qualities that they have. You know, on top of that, um, does it have to do with Deva Nusati? Um, Yes, it is also related to that. Uh, the Devata Nusati is actually about all the gods, all the way from the very bottom. So it is whatever god you feel you can relate to. Uh, but even the uh, Chapter Maharajika Deva, the lowest Deva, is actually included in the Deva, Devata Nusati. Uh, and then all the way to the Paranimita Vasavati, and then those beyond, Uttaring, those beyond that as well are included. Uh, we will ha we'll have a look at those later on, those, those kind of various variety of gods. Uh, yeah, it would include Mara, it's true. But I, but I think the I think the realm of Mara is more than just Mara. Yeah, so it's probably we should probably recollect the other ones in that realm. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> How is everyone feeling about the um, uh, kind of the uh, the sequence, the layout of things? Is it working well? Are you happy with this? Yeah, yeah. Is it all right? Uh, yeah. Is it nice to have 10 minutes of meditation in between? Does that work well for everyone? Yeah, it's nice to have a, yeah, it's good to have a break, isn't it? To kind of relax a little bit. Yeah, okay, good. So please, um, if, um, yeah, anyway, I'm glad to hear that. Ah, which one? Uh, thank you, Ajahn. Uh, regarding the uh, notes where the Danda Pani, right, where he is mentioned that, uh, he is the father-in-law yeah. and the father to Yasodhara. But then, uh, from what we know, is that the Yasodhara that that character was not to be found in the, any early Buddhist text at all, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we the character, the name is not found, but uh, obviously uh, Rahula had a mother. Yeah, so the Buddha son would have had the mother. So someone would have been the mother. So where, I guess the father-in-law would have been whoever was the father of the mother, maybe. So whether 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 she was called Yashodara, whether she was a princess, who exactly her her identity, I think, is very obscure. Yeah. But uh, there would have been somebody, yeah. So uh, I guess we can assume that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Ajahn, yeah, going back to the topic about underlying tendency, yeah. uh, which you mentioned that it actually awaiting any time it could explode due to the conditioning is right, right? So um, I would like to know, like, so how can we actually manage this uh, tendency uh, in a more wholesome manner? Because usually mindfulness will actually come slightly later. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in between, there is a gap. Yeah. So how should we manage that? Okay, so I'm gonna, are you going to come tomorrow night for the talk tomorrow night? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can continue from here. <laughs> yeah, but yes. tomorrow night is not part of the course. Tomorrow is a separate kind of public talk. But you, if you're going to come for that, I'm going to talk about that down there. Uh, but the, the idea, what, what I'm going to basically talk about tomorrow is the idea of right view. Uh, and I'm going to show you how right view is one of the most powerful things in dealing with the defilements of the mind there. That's really what you're asking about. You are dealing, you want to deal with those underlying tendency. That is, when the defilements are about to arise, how can you stop them from arising? That's what you're asking about, really. And so uh, the answer is, uh, a large part of it is right view. Uh, because right view is the foundation for understanding why it matters. Uh, and that is a very important part of this. Uh, because things that really matter to us they become important and we don't forget. Uh, yeah, That's why right view is so important. Uh, and then right view is also the source of mindfulness itself, which helps you also to guard the mind. Uh, so right view is really the most important thing here. Uh, and uh, yeah, come on Sunday, I'll discuss those things in more detail then and how, how exactly to deal with that. I uh, don't want to repeat myself too much. So you, can, so you have a good reason for coming on Sunday. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. so good then.
Uh, Ajahn, maybe taking on from the earlier questions about um, yeah. taking responsibility and or not taking responsibility, mm. I suppose the struggle for all of us, including, you know, is that uh, uh, it's hard because somebody has to take the blame, right? For somebody has to take the blame or credit for something good <laughs> or something bad has happened, and yeah. we want closure. We want some kind yeah. of closure and says it has to it has to end with somebody. You know, yeah. at fault or somebody has to be responsible, right. so, and and yeah. it has to be someone, or it has to be me or somebody. Yeah. That, that, that's hard for us to reconcile because that's how we have been. We, yeah, we, we have always yeah. been been thinking about. Yeah. And, and now now you're saying that it, it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's nothing to do with me. It's kind of. It, well, I, yeah. I, I think I, I think the uh, I mean the, it's obviously. Uh, there's obviously a cause, yeah. If if someone is to blame, if there is something has gone wrong, you know, the the company goes bankrupt because someone made a mistake or, or whatever, then uh, obviously a, a fault has been made, and so we recognize that a fault has been made. But uh, just because you recognize a fault doesn't mean that you have to blame that person very strongly. Huh? So what you do instead, once you understand that a fault has been made, and you understand, well, that person. Uh, that many things you can do, either they need more training to understand what's going on. Okay, I better train them in the right way so they understand. Yeah, we haven't been trained properly or there's been a misunderstanding or whatever. So then you can rectify the situation because you understand the fault was done. In the extreme case, you can fire them because they, they may not be the right person for the job. Yeah, maybe they don't understand properly or whatever. That is like taking consequences of the fault. Uh, but that doesn't mean you put personal blame on the person. Uh, you just understand that well. They have been conditioned in this way, uh, so they, you know, so they they made that mistake because of conditioning. Uh, but uh, you know, telling them off is not probably probably not going to help anyway. If you get really angry with someone and you know, tell them off, usually they become just angry in return, right? And then you, and then they get, become defensive, and it doesn't really work. But if you say, okay, I I understand. Yeah, you you know, there there is an issue here. There's some maybe we haven't trained you well enough, or you know. I'm sorry you didn't understand this before. Uh, let's see if we can solve this together. Uh, yeah, and so we can resolve this thing. Uh, far more likely the person will listen to you and actually take those things uh, on board because they feel that you care about them. Uh, yeah, and when you care for somebody, you care about them, well, then they will usually listen. Uh, but if they feel that you're just blaming them, even though, you know, all kinds of cause and conditions conspire, you know, against people, uh, then they will feel probably unfairly treated and probably with some reason, yeah, because actually life is complex and difficult and all these kind of things. So, yeah. so, so, so prison, prison is not a good idea? <laughs> no, pr prison can be a good idea, but not because you want revenge, yeah? You have to have prisons for the right reason. And prison just for revenge, I think, is crazy. Why do we want to take revenge? Revenge is kind of the, one of these really ugly human traits that you see around the world, but it's really ugly here. Yeah, and it doesn't really make any sense at all. So we put people in prison because they are a danger to others. Uh, and then we put them away for a while. Put them away so that they can be rehabilitated to society. Uh, a prison should be a system of rehabilitation, not a system of punishment. Uh, and very few societies do prison well, in my opinion. Uh, we should try, okay, now you are in prison. Okay, you are here because you made a mistake. Let's work together to see if, how we can rehabilitate you to kind of get you back on track again. Uh, there's some interesting research about prisoners that shows that 90% of prisoners, uh, they uh, uh, just made a mistake. Yeah, they made a mistake in life. They can't really go. Uh, they they uh, didn't really want to do what they did. There was kind of just something happened in life. They actually want to be good citizens. They don't want to be evil-minded people. Then there's a tiny percentage that are hardened criminals Yeah, who are really bad and you can't really uh, get them back on track again. Uh, so 90%, yeah, we should give them a chance. Uh, instead of what happens in many prisons today is that when you go to prison, uh, you come out much worse than when you went in because you are badly conditioned by other hardened criminals and these kind of things. Uh, so we put them in and then we help them to become good citizens again. Uh, then when they come out of that prison, uh, they will function again in society. They become good people and they actually contribute to society rather than becoming an eternal drag on society because we treat them badly. So we have to get out of this stupid mindset of revenge. Revenge is just so primitive, right? It's a primitive kind of emotion that we shouldn't really, that we should try to, uh, try to avoid, I think. Yeah. Anyway, let's um, come back to the uh, sutta again then.